Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Blue Star Rising. Michael Dunn here and with Reverend Maya Christine Nartumid. And today we're going to explore something that may sound like myth, but actually has science. And we're going to be sharing that science with you. And we're talking about the deep and fascinating topic of the inner earth. Some people refer to it as the hollow earth. Um, we go with the inner earth uh, phrase here. And this is something that has come into more prominence lately. You hear legends, you hear myths, it sounds ridiculous. Everybody knows the earth isn't hollow. There's magma and rock and iron core, etc. And yet there are more legends, myths, traditions, anecdotal evidence, and now what we will share with you, an actual scientific basis for what is meant by the reference to an inner earth, an inner earth civilization, which is essentially at a slight dimensional remove from our own ordinary 3D reality, a slight one, such that, for example, here in the San Luis Valley, people report going through portals on a given day. There's electromagnetic anomalies around this valley, like you wouldn't believe. And one day you happen to turn a corner to a cave that wasn't there the day before, and there are fairly reliable accounts of people having experiences like that. So what Maya, however, is going to share with us today uh, is a deep look at um, her own experience, the science behind it, and what she has received from the Thoth extreme over the years of her, of her work. Um, and Maya does refer to it as the inner earth, and her conscious connection to the inner earth begins in 1978 with her mental and astral projection journeys into that realm. And Maya has written extensively about this interior realm throughout the years uh, of science and civilizations and the history of the migrations of surface dwellers into the inner domain. So um, Maya is going to share with us uh, about the role of the kindred, as we could accurately call them, who live at this slight dimensional move in the inner earth, and how their very presence beneath our feet is a crucial part of our journey and movement through the dynamics of the ascension timeline into uh, what Maya refers to as the new Earth star or world system too. So with that, Maya, uh, we're eager to hear about this really fascinating reality. Thank you, Michael. Well, before I start, I'm going to take about three minutes to say that for those of you who have been following the reverse H marker uh, material that I've been writing about and how it uh, is a reverse spin of what's been put into the infection and how it can break up the sonic frequency. We now have the pendants. Now this is the side that's, that's the um, flower of life, but voila, you turn it around and there's the marker and it's done in shungite. And um, I just prefer to wear it this way because I like the marker right next to me, just a personal preference. So you will find a link uh, among many, uh, below this, this video that tells you how to, to get one of these. Uh, this is not a big commercial deal. I'm not taking anything from my part in it. And the young couple who are, have a wonderful uh, uh, work going of their own with all these sacred things, um, they put a lot of time and energy into this and the other item that they're working on from the Thothic uh, signal that I've received. Um, so they certainly deserve to have their supplies covered and a little bit of their time and effort, but they're making it very, everything's kept bare minimum expense wise for this particular thing. Uh, so, uh, soon, very soon, they're going to have the, the device and we're going to talk about that later. Now back to the inner earth. Okay, may I, may I just jump in yes. just for a second here? Before you certainly may. Um, which is just to elaborate a little bit on what, um, Maya just shared about, um, the medallion and the reverse marker um, and how it interacts with the Shungite field. Uh, this is something that, of course, we urge everyone to practice 
hand washing, safe protocols of social distancing, and pay attention to you know the mainstream medical science coming out on this. Um, what you know the dynamic that Maya has received is operative uh, within the infection is uh, something that can actually be uh, disabled uh, by working with this reverse marker um, and because there is a, um, let's just call it a dynamic within the infection that um, outlasts the duration of the cycle of the infection and uh, is a potential control mechanism that we don't want mm -hmm. in our beings. So you can believe that or not, um, but practice social distancing and pay attention to your CDC recommendations. Anyway, just needed to throw in that little um, disclaimer. So uh, thanks for waiting on that, Maya. And, uh, and that. yeah, and indeed it is genuine. It's not just with a wink. We genuinely, genuinely mean that. Um, there's more to it. It's not simply you wear this little pendant around your neck and everything is okie dokie. It doesn't go that way. And you'd have to read my material and, and I'm going to be putting out more on how this can work for the mm -hmm. planet. All right. So we're going to get into the inner earth material here. And I, I want to say in, in my preface that the reason I'm bringing this up and so extensively at really devoting this whole hour to it, which is not going to be the norm in our shows, um, is because my guidance is strongly that people need to, or some people, they feel resonant with it, need to be offered the insight that it's not just something, oh, isn't that neat? There might be people living inside the earth. No, this is a part of a scientific quantum dynamic of the planet. We have the cosmic field and the cosmic beings that are helping us, and everybody more or less is listening to this, agrees to that part. We have us, but we also have our kindred within the earth. It is not only a, 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 a truck, triangle a sacred triangle of of intelligent consciousness that's working with this planet it is a dynamic of the physical earth it is a um a true dynamism of uh, a, a battery that this earth is and how it operates so in understanding that or at least touching into the understanding on it i feel and i'm being guided to do this because i feel and they feel that it is important for people, at least some people, to, to uh, understand and bring forth in their own consciousness, which then connects to the whole planetary field, uh, that this dynamic trinity exists because it is essential in the ascension dynamic, so which when you're we're all about, working with. Yeah, so when you're talking about this dynamic trinity, uh, you're talking about um, cosmic beings, cosmic beings, um, our own, you know, humanity here on, on the planet in 3D, and then at a slight dimensional remove our kindred. Are those the three corners of those the are, as it were? Yes, those are the three uh, human, uh, some human, because they're really all, all a degree of humanity, um, and certainly the inner earth ones are. But it's also, if you look at it from a, co from a standpoint of, of just sacred geometry, and in actual quantum physics, you have systems. You have a cosmic system that we're floating in. You have the planetary system that is in two parts, synchronous parts, but nevertheless two separate fields that are operating together to create this planetary battery. And my material goes into that, um, not the older material, which is mostly what I have written. Uh, I have more understanding of it than I did then. And I plan to bring forth a little more of that understanding because I began writing about this. I began my experiences in the seventies and I began writing about it in 1980. So as you can see, it's been a long time. And of course I've written about a lot of other things, but um, I'm, it's, I'm coming back to it now and I, I'm being shown the true dynamic uh, quantum uh, field that this planet operates in is, is remiss without that other part i mean you can't you can't complete the equation on a on a scientific level 
if you don't understand the operation of why we all planets that are ensouled, and I'll go into that a little later, have a central hollow slightly removed. And what that's about, it's not some magical thing or whatever. It is a scientific quantum field dynamic. And it's important. It's important to at least you know, think about that because then a lot of other things fit into place when you're looking at the process that it takes for us to get from point A, which Soth calls World System 1, what we're in now, to point B, which Soth calls World System 2, which is New Earth Star, um, you know, to be able to go through that portal, we need to at least have some grasp of this dynamic, or at least if some of us do. We can yeah. carry it through. Not everybody, of course, is not going to listen to this show and get that information. But, you know, just enough minds, it plugs in to the central mechanism, the, the, the dashboard, you know, and, and it's in the signal field. And that helps yeah. the whole process. And that's yeah, what I'm I hearing you. And when we share with people what our mission statement is here on Blue Star Rising, Templar Awakening, that this is about sacred, applied to sacred science for the global crisis, you might say, well, you know, what does some inner earth fantasy realm have to do with getting us through the global crisis? Well, as you describe it, you know, for an accurate understanding of the quantum dynamics at work in this unfoldment, if we're going to go with the concept of there is some powerful transformative process going on with Gaia, the ensouled being of our planet, humanity, moving into a completely new phase, you know, a, a snake shedding its skin, a chick coming out of the egg, whatever analogy you want to use, there's something going on. And that even with everything going on with, you know, with the infection and the geopolitics and the lockdown, the trying to rise above all this and stay centered in an upward and forward soul path, that it's important for us to understand the, the full picture um, just on a quantum level on the planet. Is that a, a pretty good way of... Yes, it, it is indeed. Different? And then on the more human level, as I get into this, you'll understand this is such a human thing. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but, but on a human level, it's very important as well. And you'll see as we go along here. But I want to start sort of at the beginning, but I'm skipping over a lot, of course. I'm just going to touch on these certain highlights and points. Um, I was born... In 1949, oh my God, in, um, in Venezuela, in Caripito, Venezuela, America del Sur. <laughs> and um, my father worked for an oil company there. And, and um, so I was born there. And it was not far, as the crow flies, or maybe you could say the condor, from Angel Falls. And I think everybody kind of knows about Angel Falls, that beautiful, incredible falls in Venezuela that's so high and so wide and so deep. <laughs> and um, I was not born that far, far away from it. Um, I left Venezuela when I was two and a half. And I remember, you know, I had a very unusual mother. And um, she, she opened doors for me in my she seemed to know just instinctively that I wasn't going to be, you know, just a little housewife in Connecticut or something. And I don't know how she knew I was only two, right? But she seemed to. And this was 1949, not, you know, not the 21st century. Um, but we were flying over the, over in a prop plane, of course, because that's all they really had then, uh, over Angel Falls. We were on our, we were leaving Venezuela, coming back to the States. And I remember, I swear to you, I remember this moment. I don't remember anything else about it, but just that moment. She pointed out the plane and down, down, down. And there were these falls, you know, because a prop plane doesn't fly that high. And you could see them. They were just down there below. And she said, there's Angel Falls. And she told me a little bit about it. And I, I was pretty savvy at two and a half. And I listened intently. And I was staring at it. And she said, you know, they say that there may be dinosaurs up there. And I was like, because oh, I love dinosaurs. <laughs> I don't know how I found out about them. There was no television. There was no anything. But I guess my mother told me about dinosaurs. She was my, she was my Google go-to <laughs> in those days. 
<laughs> you know, I'd just say, Mom, tell me, and she'd go, tch, 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 and find something really interesting to tell me. So anyway, that's my memory of Angel Falls, and it plays into this rather well because I'm going to reach over here for a second to one of my uh, source issues from the old periodicals because I have it written in here. It's very brief. Um, someone sent me in the 1980s an article, and I don't have the article present here, but I'm referring to it here. Um, uh, but I do say, I do say, I remember vividly sticking my nose tightly to the window of the tiny prop plane and peering down over Angel Falls as we passed above it. There was a feeling within me that stirred silent memories. I could not put them into form in my young mind then, but I felt as if, I, if an invisible umbilical cord stretched from that high plateau of the Mammoth Falls into the center of my soul. In 1974, a group of explorers descended into the mouth of a giant hole discovered atop that same plateau. They were only able to go to a certain depth, but the hole continued after them, plummeting into the darkness. The explorers brought to the surface several prehistoric plant species. Their, this expedition was reported in the London press. I cannot help but believe that some part of my being came out from this tunnel, from the inner world. And it's interesting because I tried to follow up. The person that sent me the actual article, I wish I had it still, I don't know where it is. Uh, I, I told them to please watch out for more information on it because the article actually said they're, you know, they're going to go back and do some more, you know, and I, nothing, you know, there was never anything, at least that came into my hands that, indicated any more research but perhaps perhaps that was that was kind of maybe it became kind of a black ops who knows but um that was the beginning and i also want to mention at this point and it'll be more uh, obvious why i mention it that when i was four and we lived in the ozarks then my father went it's got rather extreme from the oil company fields of the of the um, you know venezuela south america to the ozarks where he had a little dairy farm and when i say a dairy farm not one of these big horrible things that murder baby calves and everything my father loved his cows he had about five of them he hugged them he played with them like puppies they followed him around like children and i assure you he didn't do any harm to anything <laughs> You know, but it broke I his heart. I remember you telling me that's why he wasn't such a su successful dairy farmer. Exactly. It, it, it just failed big time. <laughs> and he was so sad. He had to give it up and go back to the oil fields. And that was just broke his heart. It really did. Mm. So much so that he actually died of a heart attack at, at 47. And I believe a lot of it was because of that. He belonged in the Ozarks. And with well, just to, just to um, uh, touch back for a moment on what you were sharing. So, yes. It sounds as if there were some really unusual features that were discovered during this initial expedition into this very, very deep hole that's atop the plateau yes. of Angel Falls in Venezuela. And that, to your knowledge, it has not been followed up on, and therefore it's not unreasonable to speculate that some discoveries may have been made which some powers that be or thought they were decided yeah. were better kept out of the public eye? I would think so. I mean, that's a speculation, but uh, they were, they, it was a big discovery and then poof, you know, nothing. And of course there was no Google in those days in, in 1975 or six, or, well, it was 1980, I think, then when I was sent the information, but you know, so maybe it could have slipped through my, through the cracks and I just didn't see it, but I sure looked for it. And I had that friend who, who was in the UK, you know, scouring the magazines for it. And there was just nothing. Okay. Well, let, let me ask another follow-up question. Yes. So if the inner earth is at a slight dimensional remove mm -hmm. and you had a strong intuitive sense that you had a, a memory of a, of a connection to the inner realm, through Angel Falls, or what you were experiencing of it, or something to do with that plateau, or possibly that there's electromagnetic properties there that, that open a portal. Um, it's not necessarily that one would have to descend into a bottomless pit of the hole, 
um, atop Angel Falls to find this. No, uh, but uh, I, it is true also that there are tunnels that do lead into the inner earth. And how is that possible? Well, Thoth explained to me, or the Thoth Extreme did, that when I, if I were to get up now and walk across the room, I would be slightly changing my dimensional field as I did so. Micro units. If I, when I walk back, micro units change again. Now, if you had a real clear tunnel that's going down into the inner earth, is you, it just, it, if you could do this, you know, you just, you're just tooling along, you walk down the tunnel and you keep going and you keep going like, like uh, Judy Garland and the Wizard of Oz down the yellow brick road. Uh, what would happen is, provided you could survive it, and this is why people that do go that path, the Incans, the Mayans, some of those actually went through the port, through the tunnels. They didn't take spaceships to get there, but they had, they were guided by, ultra beings and they had to have, they have to have way stations it's kind of like uh the bins you know where you come up from the deep and you have to stop and and let the nitrogen do its thing and then go on you have to stop at certain portals and as you do that your dimensional field you know gives it time to adjust and then you keep going and you will actually shift into that other dimension because it's not a full dimensional remove it's a slight dimensional remove and i'll explain a little more about that as we get onto the actual dynamics so it is possible because it has been done uh, by the by the ancients that had that had people to guide them you know had ultra beings to guide them to be able to do that to be able so to actually be comparable go. also to acclimatizing at altitude for mountain climbers for example exactly going into tibet you go to base camp you acclimatize you go to the next base camp you acclimatize right. because you you know to go any further at that point you'd, you'd pass out right exactly it's, it's it's a very similar kind of well to a degree kind of situation yes um so uh when I was four in the dairy farm, I'm just going to mention this briefly. I had a little, I had dolls. Every, you know, all little girls have dolls, right? And I had a doll and I named it Mikala. An unusual name for a doll, Mikala. Now I'm just going to leave that for a moment because I'm going to get back to it later. But I wanted to bring it up at this point. Um, I was. I was introduced to the inner earth topic by the ultra beings in Thoth in around 1978. I took what uh, you could call mental and astral journeys into the inner earth. Um, and I, I, they've actually recently told me that the kind of journeys I was taking is something that's in between what I call mental projection. Now you would call it remote viewing and, and, um, astral projection it's something kind of in between the two they said there's they said they're telling me that there's something that we don't know you know we kind of those in the in the know kind of know about the astral and they know about remote viewing but there's this in between space and that's the uh what i what i was doing so i don't have a name for it at this moment but apparently that's what was happening so i had these experiences and they were all really interesting um and one of them that I'm going to just mention right now, I mean, well, like one time I was in the air, I was over this huge city. This is not Seraphine, by the way, we'll get to that later, but this huge city, it, I could see little buildings and things around it. But what I, the main thing I saw was a statue of a woman that looked Egyptian. It was lying on her back. She had one hand here, if I could do it, and one hand there like on the ground, you see me lying on the ground like that. And in one hand was a giant pyramid that I was told was about five times bigger than Giza. And on the other hand was the same thing. And there, it was huge. Now, nowadays, because we know about these statues, these huge monolithic, we can see faces, you know, the big faces, not just the man on the Mars famous one, but there's others. If you Google you, incredible statues, giant, 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 giant statues on Mars, they're lying that way. They're lying on the ground looking up, you know, it's like a sand uh, carving or something. Well, I didn't know that in those days, of course, but that's what 
it was like. It was on the land. And it was just absolutely incredible. I couldn't even fathom why they would want to do that, much less how they could do it. I didn't even ask. But that was one thing. The other thing that I'm going to bring up is um, that it, at least once, but I think more than once, it's a long time ago, and I didn't keep journals on this, um, they had me wash my hands in green liquid. Now, to washing hands is a big deal right now, obviously, but this was not about, you know, keeping my hands clean. This had something to do with the chakras and the palms, and I think it helped me adjust in whatever field I was in which wasn't quite astral and wasn't quite remote viewing, whatever field I was in, th this green liquid rubbing into the, the, the centers of the palms apparently helped me adjust to that or something of that nature. And I mention that because now I'm going to just go very briefly. It's a long story, but I'm not going to tell it all. Uh, to 1972, when my mother and I read an article written by a man named George L. Lawrence, and he was, he is, his credentials were impressive. When I say impressive, you know, like this, and one of the things he was famous for, one of those people that's famous that you've never heard of, <laughs> one of the things he was famous for was the, the invention of the world's first laser engine. But he was starting, or, or Wanted, he worked for the Ecola Institute, and and he was wanting to create his own institute because his research was really, in those days especially, far out, right down my alley. <laughs> so um, we, my mother suggested we contact him. Of course, this was all letter writing in those days. We did. He responded. He really liked my work that I sent to him, so much so he invited me to become uh, you know, on to come and be a part of his institute. But he said he didn't have the funding right now, and that was, you know, for when he did, he wanted me in the institute. So we developed a friendship with him. We wrote letters back and forth. We even met him once in Las Vegas, and we just got real chummy with him, like a good friend, as well as someone that I might be, you know, involved with on a, on a science level in the future. And he was equally friendly with my mother. So one day he wrote her, and he expected her to share the letter with me, but a lot of times he just wrote to her, you know. Um, and he said, oh, my gosh, I had this incredible dream. He said, I've never had anything like it before in my life. I was shaking all over when I woke up. Um, and he said, uh, he, he explained that he was in this building. It, it was, he saw these Egyptian figures for people and, and all of this. And as he was explaining, even at the time, my mother and I were reading this, we were going, oh, my gosh, he went into the inner earth. I mean, it was just so obvious from my journey. You know, it just matched up so beautifully. He didn't know that. He was just sharing this dream that was the most real thing he'd ever had. And in the dream, at one point, he was asked to wash his hands in green liquid. So that pretty well sealed it. We knew where he'd been. <laughs> and uh, out of that discourse uh, emerged the symbol that he drew that had been drawn on the floor. and it. When I saw it these many years later, just about a year and a half ago, I looked at it and I went and I said, what is this? And I received this is the, 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 the sign of the planetary genius of the planet, the signature. And I just freaked because I'm not going to go into the planetary genius right now, but it's an essential part of this whole inner earth thing. It's just an amazing topic. And when I realized that those many years ago, he drew this symbol because he saw it. And I wasn't, didn't even know about the planetary genius at that time. And these many years later, there it was. So, you know, here's another, someone else that went through an experience like this that was profound. Unfortunately, he disappeared shortly after that, and I do mean disappeared. Even Christopher Bird, a colleague, friend of his and mine, who was the co-author of Secret Life of Plants, we called him, he says, I haven't heard from him either. He never surfaced again. In none of his writings, you can Google, uh, None of the writings passed the date of 1974 when he stopped communicating. Very interesting. But anyway, that's an, a little mystery involved there. So uh, I'm going to pause for a moment. Do you have anything you'd like to say, Michael? <laughs> Go for it. Refresh yourself. Um, yeah, it's, I, I did some research on L. George Lawrence and can corroborate what, what Maya is saying. There is, you know, you can find him um, online. And there is a strange gap 
between you know the the date at which he f- completely fell out of communication with Maya and her mother, and they were close friends and they were communicating regularly, and it was as if he just dropped out of you know the face of the earth, and that uh, according to the the stuff online, he lived for like another fifteen or twenty years, if not longer, um, but his output as a scientist absolutely stopped. It was you know, again, reasonable to speculate that for someone who was going into the realms that he was, that he was advised to stop the the, the direction he was going in. Um, yeah, was in not fact, to be permitted, right? Yes, in fact, he told us in one of his letters just before he disappeared, he was so excited because he thought he was going to get some funding now from the government because the government was interested in his work. And then poof, he disappeared. Yeah, so it's pretty pretty obvious to me right yeah so anyway um so we get back to the inner earth here um the way the i wrote a wrote quite a bit of science on this and it's in my my uh old issues of the source and everything that i put out in the 1980s um I don't want to go into a whole lot of stuff here, but, you know, just to give you a sampling, because you really just can't imagine this unless I read a small, very small part of it to you. So that's what I'm going to do at this moment. Um, This is from um, issue, I think it's 1980. uh, It's issue source one, 1980 of the source, my publication that I put out in those days. And um, so I'm just going to read a little just to give you an idea. In order to understand how the central earth, I also called it the central earth, interacts with us, we need to draw our attention to the core of the planet and move upward from that center through the layers of matter, space, and consciousness to the surface of the globe. With Within the very center of the sphere, there is a brilliant mass of atomic particles known as the central sun, the Atoma, A-T-O-M-A. Much smaller in dimension than our solar sun, it differs also in its atomic reaction. While the solar orb is without atmosphere, um, suspended in airless space, the central Atoma is within a field of density at the very heart of a matter sphere. This causes a compression within the chain reaction of colliding particles of the small sun. The whole process of hydrogen changing into helium occurring in the solar sun is followed at a much slower and less violent pace within the atoma. The strong magnetic field of its placenta, the earthen ball surrounding it, makes a complete chain reaction within the central sun impossible. Therefore, it is in a constant process of folding inward, much like the first stages of a black hole formation. But the yin-yang balance of the Earth's magnetic field does not allow for this purpose to complete itself. And so the atoma enfolds itself to the point of the inward falling, that stage in which a plunge in density seeks the center of itself continually creating a black hole. As the magnetic flux of the central sun approaches the inward falling, the opposite current carries it back to its beginning cycle. The sun of the central earth is thus suspended between the two extremes of violent chain reaction and inward volution into the black hole vortex. The atoma appears to be a dense, brilliant cloud, the the photosphere disk portion being much smaller in comparison to its whole body than the portion of the photosphere of the solar sun to its whole body. The mass of the atoma is less dense than the solar orb, but more stable because of the controlling Earth gravities about it, which the space sun lacks. The atoma is surrounded by space, however. It is suspended in the central space of the planet. But this space is an atmosphere and not a vacuum. In many ways, the central sun acts in reverse to its solar brother. The atmosphere becomes more dense as the atoma is approached. Within a few miles of the corona, the atmosphere is so heavy that a thick hydrogen vapor is present, which bursts into illumination. As the Earth rotates on its axis, variations occur in the density of this vapor or helia, causing different intensities of light. These changes in the helia 
are most, most prominent at the apex of a 10-hour cycle during our seasonal period of July through January and a 12-hour cycle from our February through June. While there is a gradual altering of the light produced from the atoma during the day or the 10 to 12 hours, the twilight comes much faster than does ours and with greater kaleidoscopic splendor. It lasts for five hours after the 10-hour cycle and three hours after the 12-hour cycle. After twilight, or muria, comes the beginning of another day's cycle. No god of the night places its dark cloak over the subterranean world. It's kind of like, you know, up there to close to the poles where you never get complete darkness in, in the winter or is it in the summer or whenever. Right. Yeah. So uh, do we understand then that this is a description of an inner earth night and day cycle yeah, how, yeah. where people might tend to imagine something like you know a thousand leagues under the earth or some Jules Verne sort of thing that uh, and you know you, you can't imagine having uh, a lake an ocean with a sky if you're deep inside the planet right but, but what you're describing is that this slight dimensional remove includes um, because of its correlation with the central sun of Toma and the and the central sun of the planet, that there is um, some kind of um, dynamic at play that um, essentially creates a, a night and day cycle. Is that right? Yes, exactly. And it's a, a lot like what we see at the uh, you know the um, aurora borealis. It's very much like that. It is a little like that all the time, but very, very slight. But at night, so to speak, or this evening state, this Muria or whatever, it is, it's much more intense. You know, it, it, there's, it's not exactly like that, but it's very, very, very close. It has its own fingerprint, in other words, but, mm -hmm. but it, is a, it is a beautiful sight to see. Um, yeah. Okay, well, maybe at, at, at this point, if, if this works for you, Maya, we could go into exploring, you know, first of all, who these kindred are that you describe, how they got there, um, and what our relationship to them is now or is evolving into now that we're reaching this transformative moment. Uh, I know you shared, well, why don't you just go ahead and, and talk about yeah. who these kindred are and the migrations, how they got there, and what their relationship to us is i will but first i do want to mention the last little part to this that i feel is kind of important on the dynamic of the central earth is that when a planet becomes ensouled and by that it's not just a rock but it has it goes through a process where an actual we call it gaia a sold it's not a soul like we have but it it is a a planetary soul it's a type of soul literally is moves into the form and becomes a living vessel. And when it does that, um, at some stage in that process, and you know, I'm missing some pieces here because I don't know it all, but in some stage in that process, it's as if you take this sphere and you go, whoosh, and as you twist the, the energies around it a certain way, I say the energies, is it the, I think it's the electromagnetic field. It has a certain twist, like you're opening a bottle, like you're going like that and you open it when it twists like that it literally goes it literally springs open the central the central hollow now it doesn't look exactly pristine oh there we have the streams and the no it, it's not but it is a hollow and then it starts to create and build itself and survive and thrive and then you have eventually you have grass and trees and you know things start forming in it because of the central sun of tumble what happens is when that twist occurs the seed at the core at the molten core separates its energy field and creates a, a slightly removed dimensional opposition and in that opposition life can thrive now Again, I don't have the whole picture at this point. This is kind of a new part that Thoth gave me. I didn't realize that when I wrote this in 1980. This is a new part of it. So I can't really say much more right now. I have a feeling I'm going to get more. And when I do, I'm certainly going to share it. But that's what I have at this point. So that said, we'll move into what uh, um, Michael suggested. I'm really thirsty today. <laughs> okay. Take your time. Uh, 
So, um, of course, I'm referring to little notes here and there. And I must admit, I'm on a new computer, not, a, my, not my main computer, but a little Mac, and I've never used a Mac before. But see, I look so much better. <laughs> and we can be in the living room. There's Jesus on my shoulder. Uh, and there's more reasons to why I wanted to be in the living room that I'll get to in a bit here. So, um, the beings in the inner earth, when, when the inner earth started thriving, it didn't create people. <laughs> there were some animals, there were, you know, plants eventually, and there were some animals and some other things going on in there. But mainly the ultra terrestrials, the ones that are our guardians and friends and kindred, because they're related to us, uh, started coming into the inner earth to put, put some of their bases in there. They were helping us out, right? They weren't spying on us. We didn't even have people on the surface of the earth yet when they were doing this. And the, as the central hollow became more habitable, they, they built a few bases and things. Not a lot, but they were in there. Um, but there were no other people in there. However, when L Lemuria, which Thof just calls Mu, Lemuria is a later term that was coined by Alice Bailey, I believe. But we'll use it. Lemuria was beginning, and then it reached a certain stage. Uh, there's a whole story around it, not going to go into this here, but a certain stage where certain persons, sacred, it contained sacred knowledge and information for the planet. We would call them, symbolically, Thoth calls them the Grail family. I believe I touched into this before. And when they uh, were threatened, some of them murdered in the last stages of the, the Murian heaven houses that were established by Melchizedek, Lord Melchizedek, from the Venusian guardian. Um, and he left and left the heaven houses to do their thing, and then the priest took over at a certain point, and things happened. So they had to migrate, and the ultra beings showed them the way down the tunnels, the paths. Maybe some of them were taken by ship, I don't know, into the inner earth. These were the first human beings to occupy the central earth in other words there there aren't natives in the central earth that you know sprung up from the soil the only people in the inner earth are the the ultra terrestrials to some extent and the migrators from the surface earth so the lemurians came first atlantis went through its thing some of the atlanteans went down there second then we have other people on the planet. We have inside the inner earth, there's everybody from Egyptians to Africans to, to uh, Celts, uh, you know, ancient races that have disappeared from this planet. We don't even have a name for them anymore. Um, Europeans, you know, there, there's different ones at different times were brought down into the uh, civilizations of the inner earth. Why? Well, they all had different reasons, more or less, but there was, a, there was a, a, a theme, you might say, that flowed through it all, and that was to preserve, to preserve sacred knowledge, to preserve genetics, not for some super race kind of strange, weird thing, but because in our genetic field of all races, of all races, we have a sacred pattern, and that pattern needs to be preserved in its most pristine state. And some of these races, you know, they were carrying it even as late as the, the, in, in, in the, the early stages of the British Isles. In, in France, in, in Europe, in Spain, you know, there, there were people that could preserve that. And they were parts of sacred orders or sacred tribes. And they were offered an opportunity to take that sacredness and preserve it within the sacred hollow of the planet, the holy of holies of the earth. So um, that is how it happened and probably still happens. I don't think it's actually stopped. Maybe it doesn't go on quite to the extreme, but there might, I'm feeling there's still some small groups of people or persons that are invited into that realm. Who knows? Maybe George Lawrence is in there. Actually, I think he is, but that's uh, another part of the story. Um, so, uh, that said, we're not talking about these foreign beings. We're not even talking about ultra-terrestrials. Sure, some of them are in there, and they've mixed with the races in there and whatever. But 
I, I've been communing more recently with some of these beings, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, but um, they're people. <laughs> they have a little different environment, and they've li lived somewhat differently. You know, It's like going to a really different country, but they're still human beings. You can still communicate with them. You can look them in the eye, and they're there, you know? And they're, they're your relatives, basically, you know? So what happened was, after this whole thing with me finding George Lawrence's letters again, all these old crinkled old letters from, you know, in the dream that I'd forgotten, and there was the symbol, and, you know, this was a life-changing event for me, and this only happened about a year and a half ago. Because, I mean, it was just amazing. I can't describe what I went through when I saw this and I recognized that he was giving me the sacred, not just the symbol, but the living energy imprint of the guy's signature. And those many years ago, and I was clueless until I, op I was guided to go to those files, definitely guided. I didn't even have time for it. It was like, eh, I don't want to do it, but no, I was guided to. And there it was. So when that opened that door again, the inner earth started coming back to me. Because I kind of left it behind. I mean, yeah, I referred to it now and then, surely. But, you know, it had just not been a prominent thing for me for many years. So when it started coming back into my field, it came back big time. And I began seeing this city that is named Seraphim. It really is named Seraphim. They're, a lot of their names in the inner earth are, you know, their names. They're like we have here. Some of them are Spanish names. Some of them are Portuguese names, you know. But this, is, this was named Seraphim. And it's apparently the city of Seraphim is like the cherry on top. You know, it is the special place that works specifically with the frequencies of the new earth, helping us, guiding us into it. All of the inner earth does to a degree because they're connected to us so deeply. But Seraphim is the point where it all comes together. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that city right now, but it's, it's the main one. And when I saw it, when I was taking a tour of it, and I could see different aspects of it, which was really beautiful, I recognized a certain area of there that I had been. I mean, I, I would see myself there, but I didn't know where I was. You know, I was like, I'd wake up in the morning. It's like, oh, I remember I was somewhere. And it was that place. So I've obviously they've been grooming me for this. Well, to go back for just a moment to when I was about 24, and I was in the work then. I heard a voice one day call my name, and it was a woman's voice. And it wasn't even at night, but I was lying down at the time, but I was not asleep at all. And I said, who's speaking to me? And telepathically replied, it's, it's you. You're speaking to yourself, but it's your, all, it's your other self in the inner earth. Like I had another body, you know, another life in the inner earth. And I said, what is your name? And I thought, she said, Michaela. Remember my doll, Michaela? Michaela. Now, I didn't think about my doll. And believe me, I had no memory of that at the time. I, I didn't connect it, you know. And only more recently did I think, oh, my gosh, that's the same name I named my doll. So um, now, coming back to now, uh, just in the last maybe four or five months, I've had a lot of experiences with certain group of beings from the inner earth and they've first of all told me actually my name in the inner earth is Mikala, not Michaela, but I just didn't pronounce it right. It's the same thing. And uh, there are other, other people on the surface of the earth, not everybody, but some people have, you know, alternate lives, bodies in the inner earth. doesn't make a special. It depends. You could be anywhere. You could be out here, over here, over here. It just happens that, you know, my work comes from the re reality that that's where I came from. You know, that's, that's another part of my soul self. So that's why I'm doing this work. That's why I'm doing it. Well, it doing. makes you a little special. <laughs> <laughs> we can allow that it makes you a little special. But. Well, I don't know about that. But anyway, um, I'm sharing this because it's not, a, it's not an absolute thing. Like, oh, this is, you know, other people, we all have lives in different places and some of them are simultaneous. So I'm just bringing that up. But the group that came to me was not her, uh, although it's part of her. We're all in this together down there. And um, I had an experience about, I guess it's been four months now. It seems like a lifetime where I was um, in bed at night and, um, I was brought into that in-between state. I wasn't asleep, 
but I wasn't entirely awake. I'm sure many of you had that state where you're just in between. You know something's going to happen. You can feel it. You're in a different energy space. And I heard the sliding doors over here in the living room open and close. Well, they, they're locked, and they have the blinds down at night. And I knew that that was the case. But I heard the door open and close. And I heard female voices. And I couldn't hear their words, but it was like, oh, look at that. Oh, look, look. Oh, this is like, you know, kind of like that. And I knew that they were admiring my altar and my, the things in this living room and all of this that I have here. I just knew that was the case. They sounded friendly enough, but it scared me. I thought some kind of spirits walking around my house and I didn't give them permission to be here. You know, I was a little indignant. And then all of a sudden I got a little afraid. Like, what are they doing here? You know, I didn't give them permission. And I felt very violated. And I, I, uh, I heard myself going, help, help. <laughs> That's all I could say. <laughs> and all of a sudden, right next to me, as clearly as I'm speaking to you now, I heard a woman say, oh, what's going on? Like that, just exactly like that. Well, that woke me up for sure. <laughs> I sat up in bed, doing, and of course, there wasn't anybody there. But this was not a dream. And um, so I decided that it was just spirits. And I thought, well, okay, they understand now that they scared me, so I guess they're not going to come back because she was obviously sympathetic to my situation. So I left it at that and moved on. But a few days later, you want to take it, Michael? What happened to you? <laughs> okay, well... Um... You know, it's an interesting perspective for me because I have such respect for you, Maya, and for your work. And uh, and I have, you know, my own perspective, my own experiences, my own spiritual path and practice. And there's a great deal of resonance, um, amazing degree of resonance with what has has come through you over all these years. And yet, you know, I'm I sort of, on my honor about maintaining, you know, well, Maya had this experience and I respect Maya and no doubt that experience is valid for her, but you know, I'm going by my own lights here, right? Sure. Um, just, you know, to be able to, well, as a communicator, like for example, with this show, to be able to share with people, I won't call it an objective perspective um, because objectivity is kind of a myth, really. Yeah. Um, but so what happened was that, uh, maybe, I don't know, two, three nights later, uh, I was in the middle of the night and, uh, I'm a deep sleeper, but a light sleeper, which is to say that I can be fairly deeply asleep, but even a slight sound in the room, uh, will wake me up. Um, like, for example, this dog just showing up and going, hey, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Go sit down. Okay. So um, I heard a woman's voice call my name, clear as a bell. Woke me up from out in the hallway. Just clear as a bell. Michael, you know, and as, as loud and as real as that. And, and I said, yeah. You know, and um, and there was nothing further, and that was very unusual. I don't have, you know, an ex it was a, a very tangible, undeniable experience, and so I happened to share it with with Maya uh, a day or so later, um, and and you know, an additional thing that that took place right around that same time there were a number of phenomena going on um, here where I'm living. And um, we had a guest at that time. It was around seven o'clock in the morning and I was just waking up and still in bed and I heard singing, um, female voices singing beautiful harmonies from uh, down on the first floor and I sleep on the second floor. And I thought, oh, somebody's turned on my yoga chant music. Somebody's turned on, you know, some... Uh, kundalini yoga music or something which I like to listen to and so later when I came down an hour and a half later I, I said to our guest um, oh do you know did you put on the Sonatam Kaur kundalini music and she said oh you mean the singing that was going on down here around seven I said yeah yeah she said no no I was still in bed so there was singing 
uh, going on in the house with no apparent explanation for its source. And um, there are one or two other things, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Yeah. And and you can pick it up where, where you received the corroboration of just who the voice was in the hall and how it related to your nocturnal visitors. Well, first I'm going to say the singing came from the Dakini who are in the inner earth, uh, not the mythical Dakini, although the myth comes from the, the truth. Uh, these are beings from, well, it's a long story. <laughs> but anyway, they're, they're, the Dakini are in the inner earth and they do the singing. I was working with them. And so obviously they paid a visit to Michael and Eleni as well. Um, so when Michael told me about the Michael call, you know, the, in the hallway, I thought, oh, well, you know, this is not what I'm thinking it is. I'm going down through the wrong rabbit hole. I got to come back and think, okay, so I need to go to Thoth. And I did, and it's a good thing I did because he said, no, 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 it's not spirits. And they had your permission, your, your Mikala self permission <laughs> to come into your house because they're preparing the energy in, the, in this house, especially in the living room for something or for several somethings that have to do with with the sacred on in the mountain and the whole energy dynamic of what, what we're doing here and where Michael is staying right now has a very special energy dynamic as well. And so um, that got my attention. And since then, I've had numerous experiences. I was too many that I'm not going to go through them all, but um, the probably the most uh, amazing <laughs> was that uh one night um the woman that spoke to me oh by the way they didn't think i could they, that i could hear them when they were in here so she was she realized all of a sudden that i could hear them and so she was very sympathetic oh what's going on you know and remember these are people they're not you know high master beings um or you know ultra beings that have to figure out how to talk to you or something. These are people. So she just said, what's going on? Like, wow, you can hear us, you know? So um, they were apologetic that that happened. I say that because I started mentally communicating with them. And uh, her name, she gave me her name. I don't know that I should give it, so I'm not going to. Um, but she uh, started communicating with me a bit. Not a lot, but here and there, mentally. I didn't hear a voice anymore. And... Um, she told me one night that she said, we're going to leave a little something for you in the living room. You know, I'm like, I didn't hear that. I, well, I didn't hear it anyway, but I mean, I didn't, it, no, no, that's just not, I, no, no. <laughs> you know, reality starts kicking in, you know. So I just really forgot it. Nothing was there the next day and I would, wasn't even looking for it because I forgot it. But the very next morning when I came out, I always walk directly across this path here to open the blinds and, you know, unlock the door. So right in my path, so I couldn't miss it because my eyesight's not very good. Right in my path was a ring. I should have it with me. I don't have it on right now. A little ring. Not a big fancy ring, but a very interesting looking ring. It looks like it has an olivine stone in it. And it fits me. And, um, you know, there are all kinds of things. I have cats. Cat could have batted it out from it's a rental house you know but i've been in here for three and a half years or three years uh how it got here where it came from i don't know if it came from the inner earth or she picked it up somewhere out there and put it on the floor and let my kitty play with it and bring it forward or she put it there i know that narla put that ring there for me one way or another and i know the reason not because it's such a special ring but she wants me to believe her, <laughs> you know. I'm really kind of a skeptical person, even about my own work and what I receive. And I try to, it's a healthy skepticism because, you know, uh, I do rather unusual work for all these years, and I have to kind of keep my feet on the ground. So I think that's the reason she did it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say it might be good to clarify you know, when we talk about them coming into your home and leaving a ring um, and yet communicating with you telepathically and apparently being not entirely physical, that what you shared is that they have a, a, a technology and technique in the inner earth of being able to travel. It's a, it's a combination of, as you described, astral traveling and 
and remote viewing with a, um, a very strong presence. And yet they are physical beings in physical yeah. bodies at the slight dimensional remove in the, in the inner earth. And they actually gather to have these sessions if they have work to do on the surface mm -hmm. where they're able to project their consciousness and, and some degree of physicality in this way. And of course, you've also shared that there are, you know, occasionally reasons for some of the kindred to actually physically come up top. And exactly. Because they have work to do up here. And so they're, you know, driving around in cars and have <laughs> right. dogs and living exactly. up mountains. And, you know, they, yeah. it's a struggle for them up here at, at, at this density. But, you know, for various reasons, on occasion, they, uh, they're up top. But just to... Clarify. I thought it would be worth clarifying about yes, you know, exactly. how it is being. And, and uh, they actually do this with little machines. Uh, I saw one in my, I laid, put my head back to rest a moment, moment in my computer and and it was with us. And they'd already told me they used little devices to help them, you know, augment them to get them to be able to do what they do. So, you know, that's what they, that was, he was, he was using that. And um, the ones that are working with us now for the most part are spending a great deal of time in the cavern area, not a cavern area, not far from here. In other words, they're not down in the center. They're up in one of the cavern areas. It's their workspace <laughs> while they're doing whatever they're doing in the Valley. We're not their only um, project. You know, they're doing things. And this is a very special place, this Valley. So anyway, while all this was going on, we wondered what was this leading up to? We could speculate. I mean, it's so many sacred things here. And, but why were they were so interested in my living room, especially? And this got so intense, uh, you know, well, first of all, you know, when the infection started, it became a little more obvious what they were doing because they had said that they wanted Michael and I requesting, Thoth was requesting, but they were part of the team because he's in the inner earth too, um, to um, have this broadcast. And it didn't have to be live. It could be pre-taped, but it needed to go out as a premiere broadcast each, each week. And they wanted me to sit in the living room. Well, I've had problems doing that because I had this problem and that problem. I couldn't bring this computer in and that. Finally, I bought this little Mac so that I could do this, so that I could sit here in this living room in this stream. There's an energy stream through here. And they've been working in this living room a lot. And I don't know everything that they're doing, but it got so intense that one of my cats, apparently my black cat, Moo, he came into the living room one night. I, this is what they told me because I asked what's wrong with Moo. <laughs> and he saw them here and he felt what they were doing. And it really scared him. The next morning, and he loves this living room. He would not enter here. And he was looking at something. He was going like this. And this went on for four days. I had to coax him out of the, under the, beneath the bed. He wouldn't eat his little goody food in the hall like I usually feed him. He loves that food. He would not come out for it. He Sometimes he would sit way back in the hall and go like this. You know, he's looking at something going on in the living room. This happened for four days. And then all of a sudden I was in the kitchen and here comes Moo just very, very directly. Like he's just being drawn along, walking into the living room. Da, 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 da. Not even like my cat. It was just like, different you know and he gets into the living room and i'm peeking around the corner watching him and he's going like this he surveys everything very slowly he just stands there for a moment almost like a little statue then he turns around and he makes that same walk back out and after that he's fine there's no problem it's like nothing ever happened so you know uh, many other things going on too. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, I feel that other people, we're not the only ones that are having experiences with this and we're not the only people that have other uh, bodies in the inner earth. I don't, you know, it, some do, some don't, but um, there's only, I thought 
the other day, I thought I heard them say 25,000 people approximately, but I was wrong. It's 25 million because when I looked it up, when I happened to come across it in my old issue here, just the other day, he said 25 million. So I went to Thoth and I said, which is it? And he said, that's the million. And I thought that makes sense. I mean, 25,000 isn't very many. Even 25 million isn't, but, you know, it's a better figure. <laughs> and, and, of course, in the city of Seraphim, I don't know how many there are there, but I'm guessing maybe, I don't know, one or 2,000, maybe 3,000 people there. That's a guess, though. Well, I, I thought it, it might be a good moment to um... – go into sharing um, some additional material that you let me know you'd, you'd uh, like to get into uh, when we're talking about the Eliohim computer that uh, oh, yeah. both of us to as the Pymander. Is this a good time to segue into that? Yes, it is, because this goes into why, why they're working in this room so and why they wanted to be to okay. do Okay, yeah, and I'll just give a little, you know, like, go. go ahead and give that little thumbnail in advance that, that you had written yes, out? go right ahead. Yeah, so uh, Maya's going to be sharing with us now um, what um, her Thoth Extreme has referred to as the Pymander, P-Y-M-A-N-D-E-R, Pymander, which is an Elohim computer, and how it helps us to connect to our creational wave forms, which have become so dispersed in the white noise that is saturating the electromagnetic field of the planet and this will lead us to examining what is called the tribe light station or a streaming channel coming from the inner earth and modulating through this Pymander or, or Elohim computer, also in the interior world. And this is a particularly powerful harmonizing and balancing uh, factor as, as I uh, understood it from what Maya has shared. And, um, and then you're going to cover what um, you received from Thoth as a psionic tribe light number. Again, mm -hmm. psionic is spelled P as in Peter, S like Sam, I O N I C, psionic tribe light number to place into your computer along with other uh, resonant templates. Yes. And to tell us how to do this and how it can serve our own well being uh, and that of the planet. Okay, so first I'm going to read you about the Pymander. This comes from my Nessia Library Research Project in the definitions, Thoth, Thoth definitions page. Um, I, if I put all the definitions I wanted to in here, it would probably be 500 pages. So I only have a few at this point in time. I don't know that I'll ever complete that work. But um, the Pymander was introduced to me probably when I lived here previously in 1993, four. In five in that period of time. Um, so the Pymander, an assemblage of energy created by the illumined being Thoth in concert with the Elohim Lords. That's another terminology. I won't open that and read it right now. Um, the Pymander evolves reciprocals for biological systems to allow and balance with source. Source is the point of absolute which every particle carries as its creation code. The Pymander, then, is an Akashic radionics device. It is non-physical and yet interactive with the physical. It responds to thought, feeling, emotion, yet it cannot be commanded by these things. It will instead balance them to the source point. However, the Pymander is consciousness, the Pymander is consciousness specific. Consciousness specific. It does not know what is not in its program database. Therefore, it only responds to what is within the database or depository. When I say consciousness specific, I mean that it responds to the consciousness and not the information. When information is placed into the database, it is the consciousness from which it originated that the Pymander evolves reciprocals from. A simpler definition, huh? and it's really not simpler, um, is, I'm, I'm not used to this little computer here, i got to bring this page up so I can see it. Oh, goodness. Hold on just a second. Let me see here. Here we are. A higher dimensional computer created from the upper strata of the etheric planes to assist Earth and her humanity with the ascension process. 
We use the term computer in this sense loosely as it has no hardware components. It is an energy organization suspended in the most powerful electromagnetic regions of the inner earth and is comprised of a consciousness type plasma, etheric substance in a highly energized state that works with the specific light encodings for specific light engendered purposes and which allows master beings to maintain and sustain a focus of intent without direct application of their own minds. It is like they can program the Pymander, and then it does the work, thus the name computer. Now, the reason they do this is because, not that they're lazy or anything, but because it filters out any um, secondary uh, frequency. I'm talking to you. I'm a secondary frequency for the information you're receiving. The way the Pymander works, its intrinsic nature filters that out. So it's an even purer form than some ultra being, you know, handing us information. Um, and it's not informational anyway. It's, it's consciousness directives. And it responds to our own innate sense of spirituality and self. So it's not... Um, manipulating us it's not programming us it's not trying to convince us of anything in our sleep <laughs> it is us it is our spiritual property that is being uh, what I want to say purified from the lesser frequencies of our habitation and brought back into our field for a higher evolutionary um, strike as it were in this in the in the zone of our sensitivity and our consciousness so um I, I read you that because it's so central basically to everything that i'm working with and this thing about the tribe light so the pymander works directly in streaming or working with the streaming of what we call the tribe light now this word streaming came to me, maybe not exactly when I wrote this that I'm going to read to you, it came in 1980 or 1982, but not far afterward. Thoth would say, well, you're receiving my streaming, my streaming, and, you know, and this all came about before the streaming thing with the, you know, internet and all of that. So when I first heard streaming on the internet, I went, ah, oh. <laughs> I, I, saw, I saw the light. So there's a lot here, but I'm not going to read much. I'm just going to read a little bit to give you again a feeling, a sense of tribe light. In order to understand how the central inner earth react, interacts with us, we need to draw... Oops, do I have... No, oh, that's the wrong page. Sorry, I thought that sounded familiar. Okay, here we are. The frequency station of tribe light is received by the brain-mind complex but it is nevertheless a frequency that can be monitored by highly developed crystal units as well. The modulation of this frequency is trinitized, meaning that it develops its field of reception through a three-dimensional three utility. Trinitized, um, it's getting darker and darker because a storm's coming on. I can barely read this. Trinitized modulation is grown like a crystal, by the increase of its velocity as it, as it has a juncture at the points of its triangular vector. Well, not too understandable. In order to trinitize a modulating signal, an artificial magnetic field of ultramagnetics must be created. This field is constructed in the geometrics of a triangle, which, th when, which when carried to its dimensional capacity becomes a tetrahedron or a pyramid. As the modulating signal is encapsulated in the pura vector, for each completion of a cycle, one layer of the trinity of energies is completed. The complex logistics of this principle is beyond the summit of our present topic. Well, I should hope so. <laughs> the main understanding that needs to be derived from this brief essay on trinitizing modulated signals is that such... Uh, um, Trinitization, translate, uh, transmissions operate dimensionally and thus holo holographically, enabling the brain mind couples to assimilate this frequency, these frequencies in their purest state beyond our common learning references. Now, I know that's a lot of words, but 
basically what it's talking about is that there is a signal that is put out from this tribe light station that originates in the inner earth and, and most specifically is coordinated in streams from the, the pymander uh, in this particular focus of this trinitization stuff and all of that that is out there for us. Now, this was in 1982, and they're talking about streaming these signals, you know, out into the realm for us to commit, connect to and to receive from. And this is done on the superconscious state, generally in dream time, in dream state, when we're at rest and our brains are, you know, powered down a bit so we can receive that signal better. Now, this is not some kind of programming or manipulation or, you know, intravenous feed. Okay, well, we had a little disruption. Uh, we had a thunderstorm and Michael's internet is out. So, I'm going to do my little conclusion here and uh, give it to Michael and he'll edit it into what we had already and add his part to the end because we were kind of getting close to the end anyway. And that's how we're going to do it. Um, I don't remember where I left off in all of that, so we're just going to continue here with what I can remember. And that is about the tribe light and how this whole business with working in my living room, scaring my pussycat to death and all of that has been building up and wanting me to sit here to do this video in this, this order where we're connecting to, um, if I can show it, this field down there. We have some things down there. And then in front over here is a lot more with um, a facsimile of the sacred on and some sacred things in there. I call them sacred as a term because I don't really know what else to say, but they're very viable energy frequencies. So they're wanting us to do these shows, obviously because we have something we'd like to share, and they're encouraging us to share these things but also to create a, um, a pathway for the tribe light signal that's very specific. And they're literally sending it through this field here. And of course, Michael on the other end with his computer, his Mac, <laughs> and his uh, energy system there. Um, so when you're watching this, even though it's not a live, live broadcast, anytime you're watching it, you're receiving that specific tribe light frequency, which helps open you up. Uh, who knows? Protect you to some degree, perhaps. You know, I don't want to make a lot of claims about it. I'm just telling you. I have people in my living room, <laughs> and they're working on this a lot. And I trust them because they're sent by Thoth, who's my, my mentor for 53, not, yeah, 53 years. And I just know it's good. If it's, they're doing it and they want this for humanity, and they started working on this before the infection. And now I see it's even more of greater importance, especially when people are sitting in their homes and have the time to be on their computers more, for more spiritual purposes especially. That said, you will find a link on your desktop. Um, and... Just a moment, I'm going to get the exact name of it here. Oops, I think I closed it. Well, darn. Um, I did. Okay, I, I can't give you the exact name, but it's the very first link of the one. Oh, here it is. Yeah, found it. Remember, this is a new computer for me, a whole new operating system. Okay, it's called... Uh, come on. It is called major templates for your computer. And these are ones that I've created through my direction from Thoth. Uh, one, the Aereo Packs was many years ago. And it gives information on each of these. Uh, the Shungite field one has the, um, the guy's signature from George Lawrence's drawings in the center of it. So I didn't put the signature in addition because it's incorporated into the Shungite field sticker. I call it sticker. It's, a, it's an image. I've put them on stickers, so I have that in the, my brain. Um, 
And there's also one of the pi that represents the pimander frequency, and on it is written a large number across it. That is what Thoth is calling a universal psionic number. For By that he means for everyone that's going to use it, 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 it works for all, one size fits all. Um, to connect more specifically and directly to the pimander, what the pimander is offering us now in this crisis on the planet. And I'm not just speaking of the infection, but certainly includes that. So um, this suggestion is on this page to create a file on your hard drive, and he has a specific name to give it. It's DF4044 or something like that. And you put these images in it, in the psionic number on the template, in, in the folder, and that's basically it. You have it in your computer. Your computer is then in sync with this signal, this frequency, and these particular dynamics. Of course, there are many reasons why we would want to do that, if indeed this is true. And I have to always say that because I can't prove it, but it can't hurt to do it. Just put it in there. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I, I feel that there's a great reason for doing so. Uh, you're going to be on your computer a lot. Your signals, your presence on that computer, especially if you're looking at spiritual things, or even when you're not and you're having to do something maybe you don't even want to do on the computer, that energy frequency is still pulsing through you. So I do want to go back and touch on, before I conclude here, and, and touch on... Um, the city of Seraphim, that is the city that in the inner earth, as I said, the cherry on top city that um, works directly with the inner earth frequencies for the planet. And I have information on that that I have, believe I have links that you can go to that will give you more information. I think they're right here. Um, I believe I put them in this I'm checking here. Yes, I have city of Seraphim in there, so you can read a lot more about it all. But how I saw it was in a, um, a large crater, very green, lush crater, obviously not volcanic anymore. And the city and then the greater, I call it seraphim, and the greater seraphim around it, going through the hills and whatever, surrounded by ocean. But in the, in the city, there's two halves of a mountain. It like, it's almost like you split the mountain in two. And these two halves of the mountain have between it what I want to call plexiglass. It's obviously not. It's some kind of a crystal and very, very, very strong connection. I mean, it's miles. And inside it, well, I say miles, three or four or five miles. I don't know. I was seeing it from the air. Is a, is a large golden temple, sort of almost, almost Persian looking with gardens around it. And there's a labyrinth on either side. People walk this labyrinth on either side and come to the center of the golden temple. There is a pathway, uh, at least I'm seeing it on one side, that they, where they start, and they walk down the processional path. They're chanting. They're carrying lights or candles or something. They go into the labyrinth. They're chanting. They go into the garden. They do some kind of a prayer meditation. I don't know exactly what. Then they take the labyrinth out the other side. Now, it's like they... Everyone that lives in Seraphim takes a turn at being part of this procession. So I see these little domiciles in the distance on, on either side. And this is where they come to stay overnight or, or for preparation for their duty. And then they do their labyrinth walk and they can go back to their homes somewhere in the great city or the greater Seraphim. So it's all arranged. So the people of Seraphim, that's their main duty is to walk this labyrinth and do this. It's not just a, you know, an airy-fairy ceremony. This is something that is energetically dynamic. And it represents, more than just symbolically, energetically, the two halves of the brain. And coming into the center is what the, the golden temple is like the golden city in the brain. Those refers to a part of the brain is a very tiny part is being the golden city and that's where all our our spiritual energy is collecting for the transitional phase and in, indeed taking us into the new earth star it's our inherent right it's where we exist more than any place else in the body um so 
when they do this walk, they're doing it for them, not only for themselves and their inner earth, they're doing it for the whole planet, meaning us on the surface. When you go to bed at night, think of that. Just think of that, that these beings, they always are doing this procession. See, it never stops. So someone is taking their turn in doing this procession. It's not thousands of people. I don't know exactly how many, 50, 60, I don't know exactly. It could even be 100, but maybe not that many are doing this procession uh, all the time. So it's a very powerful connection. And I wanted to share that vision with you. It is within the inner sacred hollow of our planet that the entire culture helix is preserved, not on shelves of antiquity complacently gathering dust, but as a living testament within the genetics and heritages of the people each page burning a star on our future horizon. Reverend William Bueller spoke of leaders surfacing in the races near to the earth. These leaders and the race charge within them will be psychinetically infused by the intact racial vibrations of the one heritage being sequestered among the diverse cultures and races ancient to this planet maintained in the inner earth world. The uniting principle can only be brought forward by the mother root that begins the divine tree, the common light mathematics vibrating through the DNA helix of all racial parts of the whole. Maya sources refer to this once existent and future persona who contains the entire code in one form as the Rainbow Man. It is said that the essence of all the tribes and peoples of the earth has been preserved in this inner realm.